Hello, everyone. Welcome, welcome. Uh, today I have a great uh, guest, uh, Dr. Uh, Violette Zahedi. I pronounce it like a French, you know, with my French accent. So maybe, sorry, I don't pronounce it uh, properly. Uh, we, in French, we say uh, Violette uh, Zahedi. Uh, she is a, medi a medical doctor and also the co founder, CEO of a very promising uh, startup. Um, Synamics Therapeutics, founded in 2023 in Copenhagen, Denmark. Uh, but just before I introduce my guest, I know it's not it's not polite. I know it's not the rule. But before uh, I introduce her properly, uh, Violet uh, told me about a very crazy uh, story offline, and, and I would like you, Violet, just to to start by sh sharing this story with our guest, uh, and then we we will start the interview. Sure. All right. Can you pull up my slides? This is the only part that I'm going to use, you know, use the slides. So, yeah, don't worry about having too many of them. Wow. Okay, perfect. Cool. So let's kick this off by highlighting some observations uh, in the drug development industry during the past decades. Many of you might already be familiar with Iram's law. So Iram's law is basically Moore's law spelled backwards. Moore's law is not a law of nature, um, but instead it's an observation showing an accelerated growth in technology over time. It used to show the number of transistors and microchips that they double every two years. So the Iran's law, that's the backward spelling for Moore's law, is basically showing an opposite trend in drug discovery. Iran's law shows that the cost of developing um, a new drug doubles every nine years. And even thinking about it and imagining a future with this trend, if this trend continues, is kind of horrifying. In 2012, a publication in Nature, the same that introduced uh, Iram's law, suggests that some factors that could be contributing to this trend. One of them is so-called better than the Beatles. And that means a progressively higher bar for improvements over existing therapies. Why do we use this Beatles analogies? Because imagining how hard it would be to have commercial success if all the new pop songs had to be better than the Beatles, if entire Beatles catalog was you know, available for free to people, and if no one would get bored of them. So this is, you know, this is how the drug discovery works right now. And another factor is uh, to the uh, Irem's law trend is the increase in lowering the risk tolerance by regulatory bodies. It's called the cautious regulator problem. And think about how risky the traditional drug discovery process is. Almost 90% of the drugs entering human uh, clinical trials, they fail. And this slow and costly process they result in delays in uh, novel life altering treatments in healthcare sector. So each day of delay in innovation costs lives. So what could be the result if this trend continues is that at some point, this industry will need to develop only the most profitable drugs. It means that at some point, there are going to be some drugs that aren't worth discovering. And those barriers in pharmaceutical industry result in this. Most innovative treatments are being discovered and initially developed by academic research groups or startups. So we hope that this trend wouldn't continue like this. And then we can already see from 20, uh, 2010 that with the use of omics information, we help validate new targets, especially for rare diseases and orphan indications. And for orphan and rare diseases, uh, we often lack specific therapies. 
And these drugs, when they're developed, they can, they can usually solve the better than the Beatles problem, getting a fast track uh, approval process. And in general, small population diseases or better stratification or precision is suggested to be strategic to break Irem's law. Another fundamental shift in this trend was due to the pandemics, a nightmare that no one can forget, you know, staying on these long queues and wait for the test and wait for, you know, a, a treatment that could finally solve all the issues that we were facing. And that, you know, that situation caused an urgency that pushed everyone, including the, the policymakers and regulators to, to find something fast. And, and pandemic had a huge impact on adaptation of AI, not only in the drug discovery, but also in the whole healthcare sector. And its importance also became quite obvious for, for regulatory bodies. And we could already see the first COVID-19 vaccine brought to market was by Pfizer and they used artificial intelligence uh, to uh, develop that drug. And looking at when it was approved, you know, considering how lengthy the approval of a new drug could, could become, it was approved already, you know, in, in August 2021. And that shows that we could use some innovation and we could you know, push uh, above the boundaries that we uh, already had in drug discovery. And what was the result for Pfizer when, you know, when in 2020, uh, Pfizer's top three sellers went off patent? And what we can see from you know, the 2021 revenue, it was doubled compared to 2020. So it shows, you know, the, the, the great potential that AI can bring also to the market by, you know, uh, creating this faster uh, processes. But the use of AI to develop new drugs was nothing new. But pharmaceutical companies, they started already, you know, during the pandemic and also after the pandemic to ramp up their AI operations. And the drug development industry is not an exception from the hype cycle that we usually see in every other industry. So looking at the Gartner hype cycle on the left, we can see an increase, the, the, the Y axis is expectation. So we can see an increase in the expectations already picking from 2020. Uh, uh, like increasing in 2020 and picking at 2021 and suddenly declining during 2022, being at the lowest at, you know, the current time in 2023. And, you know, the, the number of deals in AI drug discovery to the right kind of confirms this trend. Despite this, you can still read some announcements from this year on the big deals between, between big pharma and AI disc, drug discovery companies and some startups where Sanofi says they go all in in artificial intelligence. And that's true. Look at, you know, how many deals they already, you know, created, not, not only in 2023, but also previously. And look at the size of the deals. It's like crazy. And also Novo Nordisk, my former company, announced a few days ago that they entered a, a deal with Valo uh, that worth $2.7 billion. What's the, uh, what therapeutic area has the biggest market share? So oncology is one of the sectors that AI shows significant applications uh, in this therapeutic area. And it has, you know, it fills almost half of the market share and it's expected to grow further in future. 
And cancer is a complex biological problem. And despite you know, all the advances that we can see, 90% of death is due to, uh, because of cancer, is because treatments aren't working. So something is missing here. But for us in Synamics, it's not only about you know, this big numbers. It's not only about the business. For us, our moral obligations are towards the mother that has just given birth, has to be there for her baby, but instead needs to fight against her breast cancer. For us, it's about the mother of six beautiful kids who needs to leave them behind. She died of cancer because her therapies weren't working. And for us, it's because this dad is trying to stay, you know, to support his son, he's trying to do whatever he can do for, for the health, for bringing back the health of the kid. But instead, the only thing he can do is getting a scar matching tattoo to show the support that's needed for his son. So this is more than a business for us because half of us are expected to be diagnosed by cancer at some point in our lives, or we'll see at least one beloved family member that we need to fight against this disease. So here is um, the end of my presentation. Let me bring you back on screen. Okay, we are back. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, very valid um, indeed. Uh, it's maybe the most important um, error someone can commit as an entrepreneur and also uh, as a business, uh, in terms of business, the, the, the market is huge and the needs, the needs and demands of the market, it's, it's also huge and growing because of the growing of the human population. So um, thanks, thanks again for this uh, um, free introduction of uh, our discussion. So maybe now uh, we want to know you better and see uh, and to understand who are you and where are you from and why, uh, you know, because I, I love to understand the path, the journey of my guest and why they, they choose the study they, 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 they followed, why you, yourself you, stud, you studied med medicines, um, med uh, you, you entered med uh, university uh, and to, to, to study uh, medicine and not maybe not chemistry, uh, I don't know, astrophysics or something else. Uh, was you already uh, very, um, how can I say, very interested by uh, medicine when you were a little girl? Or, or did, you choose to become, uh, did you choose to become a doctor uh, at, at the last day of the high school? How, how, how was your, um, how can I say, the, the, how the seed grow in your mind to become a doctor? Sure. So first of all, um, I'm coming from a small city in north of Iran called Gorgan. I'm the only child of the family. My father is a medical device innovator mm -hmm. and my mother is a painting artist. So I, I, ha I used to have a very strong you know, attachments with my father and used to spend a lot of time in his lab or like office. And one thing that I learned from him that I carry with myself throughout my career is that there's no impossible in innovation. If we can't find a solution, it's because we didn't prepare enough. So we need to find, you know, the real problem. And if we find that, we can, you know, we can find a solution to, to uh, any kind of problem. That's what I learned. So that's what I'm bringing, you know, to, to our company, to Synamics. Impossibles are today, are possibilities for tomorrow. That has been, you know, what we have seen in almost all the sciences. There were so many things that were impossible sometime, but there are like something very basic right now that you're not even thinking about that. So in terms of if I, um, I, already knew that I'm going to become a doctor. I knew I wanted to create something, you know, create impact mm -hmm. since I was a child. But, you know, for, for those of you who are familiar with Persian culture, in Persian culture, 
there aren't alternatives. Either you need to become a physician, a doctor, or you need to become an engineer. Mm. You know, when I was little, engineering was only for boys. So that wasn't an option for me. Or you had to become a lawyer. So I had to choose between one of them, one of the three, and I chose medicine. But I loved always, I was, I, I love to help people. I loved, you know, to think about saving lives. Um, mm. So this is basically the background. So, um, so your father was your, your mentor uh, or the role model, you know, uh, with the bringing, bringing you in his lab and you, you, you watch him, uh, you know, doing his stuff, his engineering stuff. Uh, um, and he was a, a real inspiration to your show path, right? Yes, exactly. Fantastic. And then you, you enter at university in Iran or outside of Iran? Where did you study yes. medicine? So I studied medicine at, at one of the top university, medical universities in Iran. And, uh, you know, entering medical universities uh, is a big challenge, uh, you know, considering the, the population and how many people with this, you know, background that I told you how many people want to want to become a doctor. So that was, you know, that was very challenging, but I dedicated a lot of, a lot of time to, um, to study and prepare for that. So I studied at Chahi Beshti University in the capital, spending almost eight years there. Um, so this is the background about my university. And, um, how was your study? I mean, uh, uh, because once again, uh, There are so many uh, era to, to, to study and to discover in medicine, you know, there are so many specialties, so many ways to do meds, to, to, mm. to, to, to become a physician. You can be a legist, you know, uh, and working on dead people. We can be, a, 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 I don't know, a specialist in, in surgery. And how did you manage to, to find your way, your path in the, in the medicine world? Because it's huge. Yeah. So, you know, when you start... Or like even before you start studying medicine, you have a huge expectation of yourself and mm -hmm. huge ex expectation of what you can become when you're a doctor, you're going to save lives. But in reality, when you start, you know, already in the first years, you start to find out, well, this is not only about me. This is about, you know, it's like a, a car mechanic that needs to fix a car without any tools. You can't do that. You need tools. And those tools are basically the treatments that we have available or, you know, the medical devices we have available. If that's not available, we don't have any options for patients. And that was kind of like my frustration. And I wanted to become a part of, you know, the team that was bringing the innovation for patients. I hated to sit in front of a patient and say, well, I know your disease is kind of like, you know, it's awful uh, but we don't have any treatments for that that's you know something you need to live with for the rest of your life and that was you know still up to today for me it's one of the most difficult discussions to have with patients hmm. we have a question uh, by by divya divya we will answer the question just after uh, is is the, is the subject of this of this talk so be patient we will talk exactly about that subject uh, thanks Uh, okay, so you, when you're studying, you, you, you face a, this kind of frustration that, that most uh, uh, ph physicians can, 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 can feel, you know, that you don't have all the tools you would like to have you, you, or you dream to have to save people. And this frustration to, of the lack of all the tools, by tools I mean, of course, uh, the, uh, drugs and uh, med tech, etc. Uh, and this was, let, let's say, the... the the seed in your mind that that push you to become an, an innovator right exactly exactly so and then um uh, how do you ended in copenhagen and how do you uh, because now, now let's let's make some transition to to, to yeah to sure. and the, the story yeah. is very interesting also mm. so what brought me to europe wasn't my studies or anything in that sense i i met my italian husband in iran Um, you know, and that was the reason why we moved um, quickly after I graduated, we moved to Italy and then his job brought us to Copenhagen. And that's, you know, that's where I am right now, basically having spent the last 10 years of my life here. Uh, and I see that you also work for Big Pharma. So you are very um, experienced with how, 
uh, this this industry works also inside. Yeah. Right. So when I when I came to um, so when I first moved to Italy, I had to learn you know Italian and started you know trying to find my way into clinics or you know the the future path career path. And that wasn't that wasn't taking so long until we found out that we're going to Copenhagen. So in D Danish is one of the most difficult languages on earth. Yeah, really, believe me. You know, I started I started Italian and already started speaking Italian after three months. So I had a huge expectation on myself. But learning Danish, it took me. You know, I spent a long time three years and I'm still, you know, sometimes I still having challenges, uh, even, you know, after living here 10 years, but yeah. So when I came to, it was of course a new country, a new language, a new environment, and also a completely different healthcare, uh, you know, system that what I was used to uh, work in, in Iran. So I uh, started first, my, my first career in, in Denmark was in one of the biggest hospitals here. It's called uh, Reeds Hospital. And that was in hematology department where I initially worked in research lab and then a transition to, to working in clinic. Mm -hmm. And, you know, after spending a year and a half there, I uh, became so curious about about the pharmaceutical industry because I was reading a lot about, you know, the, the industry and hearing from some of the colleagues that, you know, physicians, even specialists that left the clinic to, to you know, to work in pharmaceutical industry. And in the beginning, I was like, okay, what can a doctor do in a you know, pharmaceutical business because it's pharmacies, drugs, and I'm not a pharmacist. So I started, you know, asking people around me, ask, asking colleagues or some people that were already in the pharmaceutical in industry about this, you know, this career path. And I found it quite, uh, you know, quite exciting and different than what I used to, you know, see in the clinic. And that's when I started, you know, I, I got my first job and the headquarters in Novo Nordisk in Denmark. I started working as a pharmacovigilance, uh, you know, um, safety physician, my first position in Novo. And um, after two years, I, I like to really, I like to, you know, uh, try different, different areas also in the pharmaceutical industry. And after some time, I started working in uh, medical affairs, getting a little bit closer to the business but I also, you know, was so passionate about how can I connect science and business? And that's the perfect place for, uh, you know, someone who has passion for both of them. That was where I became the global medical manager in Novo Nordisk and working with one of the, you know, one of the blockbusters, semaglutide and diabetes. And, diabetes. and um, so Working in headquarters has a lot, you know, has a lot of positive um, aspects, but nothing is without, you know, also challenges or like negative ones. Uh, maybe not negative, but like I, I, I needed to, to, um, to try something different. I needed to see what happens because, you know, working in headquarters is most about, uh, you know, creating the strategy and then sometimes you don't even get to see the results mm -hmm. so I wanted to see what happens when we create all these strategies spending all of our you know time here preparing and planning what happens how people execute all these strategies and you know in affiliates and also my passion for you know for cancer and hematology brought me to Johnson and Johnson afterwards, where I worked in uh, Johnson and Johnson's Danish affiliate and started working with one of the, well, you know, one of the areas that I worked before at these cell malignancies. And um, that was a very nice experience because that was exactly where I found out when I, when some of my colleagues in affiliates or like region was saying, this is a great strategy. This is a great planning, but that's not how it works for us here in this country. It was like, what? How can that? How can that be true? And that was I found out the reason. So each country, each region is super different than the others in terms of, for example, reimbursement. And that's not only about bringing a drug to the market or commercializing it. That's just the start. And then you need to, you know, negotiate and and, and uh, discuss with 
with the government whether that drug could be reimbursed and thinking mm-hmm. about how cancer drugs are expensive if they're not reimbursed basically patients can't get that for example mm-hmm. in denmark you're not allowed to prescribe a, a drug that's not you know that's not reimbursed so also you know giving me some perspectives about the challenges when you when you create a drug in a, in a pharmaceutical company until it gets to to patients that's a long journey and and sometimes challenges are even after commercialization yes this in this uh, this is in this in industry is uh, heavily regulated and the uh, regulations with the, with the big s at the end because as you mentioned it every country has its own Uh, rules uh, of working and and allowing a drug to be to be prescribed or not and to be reimbursed. It's, it's, it's a very complicated for innovator. So uh, now let's maybe talk about uh, the initiation of of, uh, of your startup. How how the idea emerged? Uh, how did you met your co-founder? How did you you know you 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 put the idea on the table together and, and discuss what you what you are going to do and how you are going to implement it. Um, maybe we can start to discuss about Synamics, right? Sure. So the backgrounds, you know, the, the initial thoughts behind Synamics is basically what I explained in the beginning. The challenges that pharmaceutical companies have right now in terms of bringing, you know, novel drugs um, that are different than the ones that we already have, not just a slightly better version of what exists. So we, I knew, you know, that was a challenge. And at the same time, I knew that each day of delay means that there are so many lives lost. So I wanted to be a part of it. I wanted to, you know, uh, the disruption, I can say that was one of the most uh, important motivators. So, you know, myself and uh, one of my good friends, Aaron, who's also a co-founder, we were the two first um, members of, of the company. So he has, you know, a very strong commercial background, business background, also together with some of, uh, you know, his back, uh, his experiences with the government. He's um, a political scientist by background, working in also pharmaceutical Novo Nordis right now. So... We were kind of like supplementing each other. I was mostly on the scientific part, you know, um, and, and and he is most on a, on a commercial part. And we were like brainstorming what kind of, uh, you know, personality traits are we looking for? Like, what do we need already in the, in the beginning of our project? Uh, what, like the team, how do we create that? No matter what technology you're going to work on, When you are going to create, you know, the, the, the startup already from the beginning, you need to think about, um, you know, something called uh, pilot purgatory. So that's what we already started to work on to like focus on avoiding in the beginning. And that means that we wanted to create some, a team that was diverse, cross-functional, and we didn't want to only have some scientific people, subject matter experts, and put them together to create, you know, the, the, whole, uh, the whole technology. Instead, we focused on, on creating a fully diverse team where we had su- subject matter experts, but we looked for some specific personality traits in those people. One of them was the willingness to change disruption, you know, not just something slightly better than technology, slightly better than others. We wanted to make a change. So that was one of the, one of the factors that uh, we included in creating the team. And also, you know, working in pharmaceutical industry for the, for the past few years, I was seeing the challenges and, and the, the, the slow trend of bring, and the costly trend of bringing a drug to the market. And I also was involved with some AI, um, AI projects for finding novel treatments with some hospitals. Mm-hmm. And I could see, you know, the potential in that and specifically uh, in, in cancer with this complex uh, the disease, you can definitely, you know, um, unlock the, the potential, the bigger potential of AIs more than what you have right now. So 
this was basically in a nutshell, you know, bringing together a team that was that was diverse, had all the competences that we needed, but also from the personality perspective, that was a right match. And we um, we focused a lot on, on the commercial side of the business as well. Not, you know, not purely the technology, but the outcome. What do we want and how do we make sure that what we create can come to the market? This is what we already, you know, focused a lot in the beginning and um, and also together with our scientific members, we secure that we are going to, to the right direction. So uh, maybe before going a little bit uh, deeper into your, your business model, I put on screen your team. Maybe you can sh uh, present them uh, rapidly to us. And and I just put the co-founder, but I can, we can, of, of course, you know, sure. uh, you have a very, you have a, here a very tough uh, team. Uh, maybe we can, we, you can, you can, um, Sure. So to the right, Aaron is the one that I talked about. He's my uh, good friend and also previous colleague at Novo. He's based in Toronto and he's a uh, current employee at Novo Nordis. He's the chief business officer right now, focusing a lot on the commercial and business side of our project. Then we have Albert. Albert, he, is, uh, he has a um, PhD in computational medicinal chemistry. He's one of the leader experts in AI in drug discovery in Europe. Right now, he's working at the University of Copenhagen as an associate professor. He's the award winner of MGMS uh, in 2021. And he's actually today uh, giving a talk together with the CEO of Excientia at the same, um, at the same organization. Uh, Halder, he is a um, molecular uh, biologist and he is based in Brazil. He is a, an associate professor at a medical university in Sao Paulo and also leading a big lab. He's an expert specifically on the, you know, on the molecular side of the project that we're working on. And um, yeah, myself to the left. <laughs> so if you, if you scroll down, then I can introduce the two others. Then we have Lidi to the left. You might know her. She's French. So she's a, a pharmaceutical executive with 30 plus years of experience in a pharmaceutical business and, and the commercial. She's worked in, uh, you know, in Tunisia and also Turkey, um, leading 400 plus employees at Novo. And um, Ali. He is another, you know, advisor that we have. He's an associate professor in the Department of Microbiology and Immunology in the University of Gothenburg in Sweden. Um, he's a, a grant reviewer for EU Commission, and he's sitting at many different pharmaceutical companies, uh, you know, in the advisory in their advisory board. So these are the two advisors that we have, and then. We have the R&D team. To the right, you have Domini. She is a pharmacist and she has master's in precision medicine. And then we have Peter. He is based in Brazil. He's the postdoc at Helder's lab. And uh, he's a pharmacist as well and a biochemist. And then we have Marianne. She is based in Canada, and she is also working closely together with Albert on the computational chemistry part. Scrolling down again, then we have our fantastic data team. We have Mei Sam to the right. He is the data scientist, Amir in the middle. He's the data engineer, and Ali, he's our uh, data scientist as well. And this is also a quite diverse team in, in terms of data. So each of them has a specific strength in our team. Okay, perfect. Thank you very much for, for this presentation. It's very important uh, because um, the question that, may, may, let's say, uh, uh, people who are used with, with startup uh, usually ask is, do you have an operational team right now ready to you know to work or do you need to hire or to and so now you show that you have a very competing and compelling uh, uh, team so you are you are 
you're right now ready to to start to to deliver right or to so uh, from, what is your value proposition so we are, we you talk about ie etc but what is exactly what you are going to do and mm. how are you going to do and for who exactly yeah So what the disease that we're going to target is, you know, in general, it's cancer and it's mm -hmm. intractable cancer and intractable cancer has, you know, several different definitions. But, you know, in a nutshell, it's the type of cancer that's not responding well to diseases or is resistant to, to diseases. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, you can include, for example, the metastatic cancers um, as a part of it, but also rare hematology cancers that don't have a, a treatment right now could be also part of it. So what we tried to, you know, since the beginning, we tried to address was those types of cancers or like subgroups of patients that had a huge unmet need because right now pharmaceutical companies couldn't really, you know, focus on those specific populations considering the, the huge costs related to that. So, someone needs to think about that part as well. And this is basically our mission. So what we try to achieve is that through AI, building a platform, and that platform is, uh, you know, contrary to many other plat AI platforms is disease specific. It means that it's, you know, considering how complex each cancer disease is, even with one single cancer tumor, the cells are, you know, functioning in a different way and showing different behaviors. Um, so we knew that our platform needs to be specifically tailored to a specific disease to be able to create something groundbreaking or a novel, you know, a novel uh, breakthrough. So what we're trying to do is, you know, no matter no matter what kind of innovation you use, we can see that, you know, that um, already now we have some really great cancer treatments, for example, CAR T, bi-specific, tri-specific uh, treatments for cancer, but we still can see this drug resistance. Mm -hmm. So there is something more than just targeting one, two or three targets in cancer because no matter what we do maybe we can slow down this you know this process of becoming resistant but we can't eliminate that so considering that that the you know including the evolving nature of cancer and then sometimes we we use the analogy of proteus the the the, the greek sea god that is shapeshifter cancer is a shapeshifter so to be able to to target that you also need to create some treatments that are shape-shifting. So what we're trying to do is to be able to predict the cancer evolvements and progression through time and create some drugs that are able to adapt themselves to those changes. We call them adaptive medicine. And these medications, we can't say right now whether they can cure the disease itself completely, but they can at least you know, um, increase the time, the, the, the duration of the time that patient can stay on one specific therapy. And that means that the next lines of therapies, they come, you know, um, uh, after a longer time instead of what we can see right now. And that is one thing. The platform is disease specific. It's not going to be a platform right now that's that can do everything you know that can discover drugs for oncology immunology cardiometabolic diseases we define that you know kind of impossible to find a groundbreaking therapy for cancer in that you know in that way and Um, we're going to use machine learning and AI technologies to pr predict. So we have a lot of, you know, prediction technology in that. And um, so this is basically about the platform and the, the, the type of the medication that we're going to bring to the, to the, to the patients. Uh, fantastic. So I get, I get exactly what you are going to do. And let me be a little bit cynical, you know, because uh, I, I'm, I'm, I have to play the role of the cynic guy, you know. Um, I want to know if it's, it's, uh, if your adventure in this, with this venture, worth it. So, mm -hmm. could you tell us a little bit about, you know, the number of people affected by 
chemo resistance and the dynamics is it's a growing phenomenon like bacterial resistance to antibiotics and what are the negative consequences of chemo resistance in cancer of course i know the answer but i want you to you know yeah. uh, to to share your your point uh, by negative consequences i mean uh, you know for passion of course but also for, for society how much does it cost to the health system mm. So in terms of like comparing that to antibiotic resistance, it's not the same way, you know, because the, the antibiotic resistance is increasing through time. But in cancer, it's like mostly cancer is increasing because of the, you know, aging population. But, you know, that's something that you can see both and with chemotherapy and also targeted therapies. Um, oh. With targeted therapies, it's a little bit slower. So... You know, as I told previously, half of the population, both in Europe and the U.S., they're expected to be diagnosed with cancer at some point in their lives. And, you know, there is it's it's the second leading cause of death globally. So imagine, you know, how big is that? And 90 percent of those deaths are because the treatments aren't working. So thinking about we already have a lot of innovation. There is already a lot going on and that's true, but that's not enough because mm -hmm. if that wasn't, that was enough, we could solve this issue, but still 90% of patients are dying because the, the treatments aren't working. So something is missing, you know, in this. So perfect. You, so you are, the, the, the standard uh, treatment doesn't work in that kind of, you know, untreatable cancers. Um, so what about, uh, let's say, uh, the solution explored by, um, by scientific research or even by your competitor as a startups? Do you have some view on that? Uh, what are, what are the, the trends in, in, in mm. that are explored right now? So in terms of adaptive medicine, to the best of my knowledge, I haven't heard of any, you know, AI drug discovery companies um, really targeting that specific niche. But I read about some research institutions in the UK that are working on this, but they're mostly, you know, targeting one specific cancer target. So that's not, you know, that's still cancer is not about one target becoming resistant or, you know, that that, that is a multiple uh, that has multiple factors. Um, in terms of what our competitors are doing, they're doing a great job. You know, many of them, they've been there in a market uh, operating and collaborating with pharmaceutical companies for the past decade. Um, but they're mostly, you know, they're the general, their platforms are more general. So it's kind of like, you know, it's a, a system where you need to start collaborating already in the beginning with pharmaceutical companies to be able to focus on one specific disease. And we believe that, you know, that kind of approach is too late because, if you are gen too general, then becoming too, you know, specific on one disease could become difficult. You might, you know, fed your platform with some some data that maybe aren't specific enough for, for finding novel treatments for, for one specific disease. So um, this is, you know, this is basically the, the competition landscape that we can see. We're very specific, very specific on cancer. It doesn't mean that we're not scalable. But we decided that we're going to take one disease at a time. Right now, we have identified four diseases with a huge unmet need and are in this discussions with very you know, famous and, well, globally renowned research cancer research centers, both in the Europe and also in the U.S., and um, I can't wait, you know, to, for the for official announcements, but we will announce that later after our seed round is closed. Fantastic. Um, let us me check. Uh, if... So uh, you, you talk about, of course, uh, the, the, the type of solution you choose, you know, um, um, so IE uh, um, driving uh, drug discovery. Uh, maybe, what, maybe we can dig a little bit into the IE part. Why did you choose uh, IE because of the... I don't know, because the opportunity right now, because we have very fantastic uh, um, announcements, you know, by, by, by different uh, research centers that ha they have uh, made great improvement with the, with the IE to, to, to discover new drugs for yeah. anti-cancer for, for anti, 
antimicrobial resistant, for example, uh, we we is, we had uh, some some recently an announcement about you know the halicin in, in, I have in, in mind against a uh, very uh, difficult uh, antibacterial resistance. Uh, they, they they find it in a couple of months. You know where, where the old way of discovering drugs failed years after years, you know, uh, and, and we know how, how bacterial resistance, particularly in, in hospital after surgery, is, is, a, is, a, is, a, is a crazy thing. Um, why did you choose uh, artificial intelligence? Uh, is it for the hype of the moment? Or, or you already were connected to the, to the, AI, to the AI scene? Uh, how how, 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 the, how the, the opportunity uh, uh, was, was uh, how can I say, uh, how did you took the opportunity? Sure. So AI, um, the, the application of AI in drug discovery is nothing new. It's been, you know, it's been there for at least a decade. And but it, it started to become more important because, you know, people found out the, the, the great potential that you have with using AI. And especially, you know, in, in, in cancer, you have the opportunity to work with omics data, you have, you know, you have genomics, you have mm -hmm. proteomics, you have a huge and vast database to process. And specifically for our approach, because we're going to use this predictive models by using, you know, a vast amount of data, the only way that you can really, you know, to work with this data is by, is, is by AI and machine learning. There is no other, uh, traditional method to 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 have a you know a, a a similar approach to that. So yeah, and and AI has been used in in the field of oncology for a, you know a few years right now, even even longer, and maybe even over a decade. So it's nothing new. And um, yeah, I, I as I told you, I worked with some AI projects previously in in uh, Janssen. And um, well, I, I found out about the great potential that you can apply to to the field of oncology there. Fantastic. Um, maybe some question about your the, the culture, the corporate culture of Cynamics, um, because you, you showed your great team, but you're all um, a little bit remote, you know. Uh, so mm -hmm. how do you work? Uh, is it uh, do you have? Uh, I don't know, a uh, regular meeting of our, of our Zoom? How do you, how your process of working together? Because it's always very important for, for people who are interested by startups. Yeah, so I, I work, you know, in pharmaceutical companies uh, during the pandemic. And that was, um, that was quite surprising to see how things, you know, went well um, in terms of operations. So that, you know, especially in the beginning where everyone was like, we're not going to have face-to-face -face meetings, what, what, what will happen? But we were still like, people were even working more efficient by working remotely because you could, you know, avoid the commuting and, and spending time to, you know, to, to go to the work and book a place for a meeting and so on. So that showed historically to, to be effective. So that's not a challenge. And in terms of like, we're working in different time zones and um, we, we didn't find any challenges in terms of that. There are still some time times during the day that are overlapping and we really try to avoid unnecessary communications because, you know, because we're kind of like busy, all of us, and uh, we know what tasks we're doing. Uh, so we really know what is, you know, what what each person in the team is going to achieve. And then if only if we need a kind of like a, a live meeting together. So we book meetings. Otherwise, emails have worked perfectly or like we share, you know, documents for for reviews and, you know, maybe some individual meetings with one person of the team. So we avoid working as a big corporate to be more efficient because you know that's the nature of a startup you know uh, i asked this question because we have all this mythological uh, image of jobs and wozniak working in a garage of the of the parents of <laughs> Steve Jobs' parents no all all startup particularly uh, the startup uh, founded by by senior scientists senior uh, physician 
uh, they are not uh, uh, teenagers, you know, in, in the garage. So it, it's yeah. it's, a, it's an adult thing. It's it's a serious business, and they know how to to you know to work together uh, with all the tools that we have with the, with the digital. So it's great. That's why that, that was the purpose of my question. Um, yeah. And right now, are you already? Um, uh, how can I say? Are you already uh, working on the sub? On a, are you? Are you? Uh, uh, are you, did you start the the the, the car? I mean, uh, is, is is the motor is the is the motor turning? Uh, do you do? Are you are are you waiting for? I don't know, maybe investor or something. Yeah. So we already kicked off. You know, the the mm. official um, official project already back in January this year. And we dedicated a lot of time on, you know, preparations for the business side and also the scientific uh, part of the project. And uh, we arrived to a point where we have, you know, uh, we're we're in the stage of negotiating with um, with some uh, research centers and hospitals, and to be able to close those deals, we need the mm -hmm. initial fundings in place. And maybe I didn't mention that previously, but. If we're going to talk about the business model itself, our business model is basically based on public-private partnerships. And that's because, you know, the research has shown that top experts in AI and drug discovery are in academia. And, you know, at least to, in Europe, you either need to choose a career in academia or you choose a career in a startup. There's no way, you know, nothing in between. And knowing that, that there are so many talents in academia and we need to tap into those, you know, hidden talents sitting in, a, in the one research center. We need to find out an innovative business model where we could, you know, we could start collaborating with this, uh, not, not really, really collaboration, but they could become part of the team Mm -hmm. while they're in working in the research centers or in academia and that's so was, sorry to uh, i interrupt you i so it was um, uh, a question that i wanted to ask you about how you work because uh, one, once again I, I would like to to little bit popularize how you you work um so because when you have uh, this kind of project with aid that that empower that power uh, drug discovery we imagine a, a room full of a very strong computer with, uh, you know, very not not the common laptop we have at home. Very powerful computer. So, uh, of course, this is a huge investment. So you are you are going to to outsource uh, uh, this to 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 uh, institution that have uh, this kind of facilities, right? We're not outsourcing. Um, so basically, our um, our you know business model is based on. Uh, creating some opportunities for PhD and postdoc students to be able to supervise with uh, what we can call a primary investigator or, you know, the, the investigator that's going to work on the project. And that means that that postdoc or PhD student is going to be sponsored by our company, mm -hmm. but is going to be hired at the research institute or at the hospital. So in that sense, also to, you know, to overcome the challenges that you have in terms of, you know, having access to patient level data, that's one of the biggest challenges in, in drug discovery using, you know, not, not only AI, but having access to, you know, to patient, patient data and in Europe also complying to the GDPR. And that's the setting that we could find could be very effective because then the postdoc or PhD student is going to have access to the you know health record system and extract the data and we're going to use this federated training model to to have access to you know to the process data and and work uh, across you know the different um, functions in the company so this is not outsourcing but they're going to be a part of the team mm -hmm. And that's again, you know, because the best and top AI experts are sitting in academia and they Absolutely. don't want to leave academia. So this is kind of like a something, an opportunity in between. 
Mm. So uh, a, a, a perfectly guided. So it's so it's a very close partnership with the with top level uh, institution, private uh, pub, public institution, uh, research institutions. And how about the the patenting uh, process? Will you uh, will you own the patent at one hundred percent? Will you co-patent with the institution? Yes. Um, so we plan to have the patent one hundred percent for the company and what research institutions they get instead is of course the funding the possibility to to have publications and to you know to have opportunities for more phd students or postdoc students but we have our uh, you know legal advisors and legal firm that's working together with us and they're um, experts on patents and ip and they're helping us in creating the right contracts mm. and uh, what about the 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 downstream uh, of the, your business model how will you uh, use this patent will you use it uh, in home uh, in house i mean uh, will you will you sanitize the, mole the new molecules or will you uh, will you just license out to big pharma how, how is your your way of uh, seeing the, the evolution of synamics yeah so in terms of you know the revenue generation we have right now we're in the beginning of the design and development of our platform that's called dynaptiv and uh we are raising eight million dollars um for for this round it's basically our first fun around the fundraising raising eight million dollars that can help us design and develop this platform to expand our R&D capacities and also to close the deals with, and, and partnerships with those institutions. And um, so this is going to be for our seed round. And in terms of the revenue, what we are going to do is that we're going to discover, of course, we're going to have, you know, new novel target discovery and compound discovery along the time while we're designing and developing the platform. And we decide to, um, to license some of the discoveries to pharmaceutical mm -hmm. companies, but we will keep some of our discoveries for further development and bringing them to preclinical and clinical studies. But after the seed round, uh, we're, because we're a public-private partnership-based business model, we're relying a lot on public grants. So um, we hope that we can unlock some uh, big public grants after the seed round. So we don't need to dilute further. And um, uh, yeah, this is basically the, the business model and business uh, revenue generation that we decided to, to have. Fantastic. So uh, you you answered my my question about uh, how you will make money. Uh, so you will you will also have so you will have a licensing out activity to big pharmaceutical company who who will take the the, the job you know to bring the molecule to synthesize it to bring it into to 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 to, to operate the clinical trials clinical trials and bring the molecule to the market. But you will also keep some of some of the design for yourself and you will do everything by yourself. You know, uh, yes, designing. Because yeah, sorry, because sorry, sorry. Contrary, contrary to other AI drug discovery companies, we're disease specific. So we already know what disease we're going to work on already in the beginning. And because of this, you know, partnerships, we also have access to patient data. Mm. And for cancer, you know, real life data is one of the most important factors to bring in not only the clinical trials, because, you know, that's not uh, that's not that doesn't include all the necessary information that we are looking for. So we have uh, this business model that will help us getting access to the data that we will need. And in that sense, we're not relying on collaboration with pharmaceutical companies already in the beginning. But of course, we can create partnerships to license some of our discoveries. Fantastic. Uh, I think we, we discussed all the points. Uh, about Cinemics, it's, it's a very promising uh, and the team is great. Um, so uh, I invite people to connect with you if they are interested uh, to discuss with you directly so we can find you on LinkedIn, uh, of course, on your website. Uh, you will find all the link also in the, in the, um, in the blog article, so follow me. <laughs> uh, and uh, before we end, uh, maybe uh, last question. Do, did I miss something you, you wanted me to ask and I forgot? Uh, do you have maybe a last word? 
No, I, I it was it was a pleasure being here, you know, and and talking about dynamics. And thanks for inviting me, Ari. I would again welcome people if you're curious, if you want to know more about the company, or you're you know trying to understand how we can have partnerships. Please reach out. And for investors, um, remember that the drugs that are going to create is going to at least help one person that you could know. So this is our, you know, our moral obligation to um, to to help patients with cancers that even despite ad advancements, they don't have an effective treatment so far. Absolutely, and. Uh... Uh, what you do is great and is uh, is uh, is not science fiction. We had a lot of publication that that demonstrated that IE can completely uh, change the rule uh, in drug discovery. They could uh, put all people like me out of job. You know, <laughs> people who are doing uh, molecular biology uh, in the lab. Uh, hi, hi, Ali. Uh, we have a friends. Can you give us a link, please? To your startup website, of course, uh, Ali Parandes Danpu. He's a great guy. I, he's a biotech guy. He's a he's a he's an IT guy. He, he he's a so many things. So I, of course, I will share the link all, all the link in, in my. In Thanks my, for your interest, uh, Ali. Let's get in touch. Absolutely. Um, so I think uh, we are we are perfect now. Thank you very much, Violet. It was a, such a pleasure to have you today. Uh, your talk was great, insightful, inspiring, and uh, I wish you. Uh, all the success and see you soon thanks for you know for your time and for inviting me and thanks for you know listening in to the audience <laughs>